he is going to introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's, it's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Zhonghui Huang, who's at the Institute of Frontier and Fundamental Sciences at the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at Case Western, where he previously worked as a research associate and senior research associate and investigator. Uh, his research interests and expertise focus on nanoscale devices and systems, particularly nanoscale resonators and high frequency resonance sensors and transducers, as we're going to hear today. He's an associate editor for Micro and Nano Letters, and it's my pleasure to turn over the floor to Professor Wang. All right. Um, thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Uh, one, two. Oh, okay. So actually, I changed it. I have changed the, the, the title of my talk to the, the Sound of Music. And uh, if you watch closely, there is a very little print here saying at the nanoscale. So I want to explain what's going on here and uh, how does the uh, uh, Sound of Music sounds like at nanoscale and what kind of musical instrument uh, we can use to play those sounds. How do we listen to those sounds and what we can do with them uh, to do some interesting things. And uh, again, Max Wang uh, with your ESTC. So uh, let's see, uh, the first slide I want to show is uh, uh, some, uh, a mixture of uh, uh, people from uh, uh, different countries, uh, including those, uh, including uh, someone we are familiar with like Feynman and Einstein and someone uh, who are uh, physicists in China. And one thing we have in common is they are all very good musicians. So there has always been this question I want to ask myself, um, are those people really physicists? Are they really musicians? So uh, based on what I'm working on, uh, I want to tell uh, three and a half stories today to share with you my perspective of how to uh, make musical instruments at a nanoscale and how to play music out of them. I'm going to show some example that's in the one dimensional case and there are some examples that's going to be in the 2D case. All right, so the first example I'm going to share with you uh, is about the story of phase transition on an individual nanotube. So why would that have to do with music? And what kind of instrument we, are, we will be talking about? Uh, I will gradually um, get to that point uh, as we walk along. So basically for phase transitions, people are pretty familiar with that. Usually uh, when we talk about uh, water vapor condense into water and water freeze into uh, ice, uh, we are talking about phase transition. So if we look at something we learned in kindergarten physics, uh, for a typical 3D system at high temperature, low pressure, it's usually gas phase. And in uh, low temperature, high pressure, it's usually solid phase. And we have liquid in between. We have a uh, uh, supercritical fluid somewhere in the phase diagram and all the phase boundaries. So that's pretty full, uh, straightforward. And we have all learned that. Now, the question is, um, for some physicists to ask themselves back in the 1980s, 1990s is what happens when the system goes from three-dimensional to two-dimensional. Uh, so some, uh, a bunch of really good physicists, including uh, my advisors, they came up with a system that uh, they have a really, really atomically flat surface, typically like HOPG surface. That's something like really flat graphite. And they absorb uh, a bunch of uh, uh, gas atoms on that surface. So those atoms are trapped on this two-dimensional surface. They can only move around in this two-dimensional world and basically form a 2D system. And they did a lot of study about the behavior of these atoms uh, moving on this two-dimensional surface. And they found a lot of rich behavior. Uh, basically in the 2D world, we also have phase and phase changes transitions, uh, all those things. And then the natural question become, uh, what happens if we further reduce the dimensionality? Now, uh, given that they've been pretty successful uh, back in the 80s and the 90s in doing these experiments, and uh, at that time, a new nanomaterial just became available, which was the uh, uh, carbon nanotube. Uh, so they have been thinking, uh, if 
we were able to absorb a single layer of atom around the surface of the nan nanotube and study their behavior, we should be able to learn more about what's going on as the nationality further decreases if we can see phase transitions. Because carbon nanotube is something that's really thin and really long, and that would be a, a good step towards a one-dimensional system. So as the research moves along, uh, people realize they are actually, uh, it's not as straightforward as people have originally thought. Uh, there have been a few key challenges. Basically, all the conventional techniques for absorption study cannot be applied on individual nanotubes because nanotube is just so small, the amount of atoms absorbed on the surface of the nanotube is so few, and basically there's no detection technique that allows sensitive enough measurement to be done to resolve all the phase transitions people want to see. So the key question is, how can we measure this uh, uh, adoption of uh, an individual nanotube? So basically, um, we have been expired by a musical instrument. And as you can see, we are looking at a guitar string. So basically what we are thinking is, uh, if uh, we look at a guitar string, a guitar string, a guitar string can vibrate at a given frequency or it have a particular tone. There is something we can do to change its tone change its tone. For example, uh, one way we can do is we can change the tension in it. That's how we tune the guitar. Uh, but there is another way, which is to change the mass of the string. If we put some, uh, 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 some something, for example, a piece of gum on the guitar string, we will immediately change its tone, which is its resonance frequency. That means a guitar string would be a very sensitive sensor for detecting any mass change or additional masses. So basically what we do is we take an individual carbon nanotube, this is from some earlier Cornell work, and they turn that into a guitar string. And by monitoring uh, its vibration amplitude as a function of driving frequency, they are able to see where the resonance frequency or what's the tone of this nanoscale guitar string is. And then there has been some uh, um, earlier work by people from Caltech and Berkeley and some European group showing that if we absorb individual atoms onto this nanoscale guitar string, we will be able to see and watch its frequency going down gradually as atoms in, uh, gradually add onto the, uh, the, uh, the uh, guitar string. So that suggests some, uh, something could be done in order to, uh, something could be done on this nano guitar uh, in order to study these phase transitions. So this is the this device I have been using. So I made a, a nano tube into a, a nano scale guitar string and I found uh, where the resonance frequency is. Basically that's the tone of that's the tone of my uh, guitar. And I start to gradually absorb atoms onto the surface of this nanoscale guitar string. And what I'm seeing here uh, in this plot, the change in color basically refers to uh, the resonance signal. Uh, that's where the tone was. And uh, in this direction, I'm gradually increasing uh, the pressure, which means I'm increasing the absorption. And at the beginning, the frequency goes down just like what we were seeing in some of those previous uh, experiments as I have shown uh, in the last slide. However, as I continue to increase the pressure at some particular point, I notice something very unusual. That is uh, at a given temperature with an extremely small pressure change, the frequency have an extremely sharp and sudden drop. That suggests the density of the adsorbed the gas layer on the surface of the nanotube has gone through a dramatic increase. So if we think about it, what kind of uh, um, physical 
uh, process uh, would look like this with a given pressure uh, at a given temperature with a teeny tiny increase in pressure, we would see the system going through something that uh, caused its density to increase dramatically. Basically, um, an analogy would be if we have a fixed volume of um, water vapor at 100 degrees C and one atmosphere pressure, if we just add the pressure a little bit, we increase the pressure just a little bit, the water vapor will start to condense into liquid water. And that is a very clear first order phase transition. So basically the sudden increase in density, uh, which is reflected by the sudden drop in resonance frequency is a signature for a strong first order phase transition. So basically in this system, we were able to uh, observe this kind of phase transition just using this uh, nano guitar string as an extremely sensitive mass sensor. So we work out the math, uh, we find out uh, the density of the adsorbed gas, uh, gas layer, and we notice there are something interesting. For example, sometimes uh, the, adsorbed, the adsorbed gas atoms form uh, something called a commensurate face on top on the surface of the carbon nanotube uh, with exactly one adsorbed atom on top of each six carbon atoms. Uh, and that's something unique to the uh, adsorption system. Uh, so basically uh, there are other interesting things, but just to summarize uh, for this part of the work, we basically uh, built a nano guitar string using uh, individual carbon nanotube. And by carefully listening to the tone of the guitar string and monitoring the change in its tone, we were able to study something pretty exotic that is phase transition in a low dimensional system. Okay, so um, this is the um, first story I'm going to share with you. And now let's uh, take a quick look into the second story I'm going to share with you. Uh, and we are going into a two-dimensional case right now. So this second story I'm going to share with you uh, is about anisotropy in a black phosphorus uh, NEMS resonator. And why would that have to do with musical instrument? Uh, let's stay tuned and tuned and uh, uh, I will walk through it with you. So first, why people want to study black phosphorus. Black phosphorus is a layered 2D material uh, just like graphene or uh, TMDC or other uh, 2D materials uh, in that it has layered atomic structures. What's unique about this uh, material is that within each atomic layer, the atoms are not arranged on a, on a plane, but instead it forms this corrugated structure uh, that basically look like a corrugated uh, aluminum board or something like that. And this unique arrangement of atoms uh, immediately give rise to something that we call anisotropy, which means the physical property of the material along these individual grooves is going to be quite different uh, when we look perpendicular to these grooves. For example, the electrical, optical, and the thermal properties uh, have already been studied pretty extensively and people found that indeed the two, in the two in-plane directions, they are rather anisotropic. Uh, then uh, people are also exploring mechanical properties. So um, if we look at this atomic structure and imagine uh, if we can, for example, stretch or compress this material in these two different directions. One would immediately expect if we were to stretch this material uh, basically uh, perpendicular to these groups, it's going to 
behave like a pretty soft material. It's going to be very easy to stretch and compress. Um, and ex as expected, the Young's modulus, elastic modulus in that direction is going to be fairly small. On the other hand, if we try to deform it along these grooves in the, in the other direction, uh, it's going to be pretty difficult to do so. And as expected, uh, theorists found that in that direction, it has a fairly uh, large, relatively large uh, elastic moduli, elastic modulus. So uh, with the theory down, how are we going to prove this experimentally? So conventionally, uh, when people are trying to measure elastic modulus of 2D material, they use something called nano indentation. So basically that's like a, uh, making a uh, uh, making a suspended membrane out of a piece of 2D material, and then they push down with a, a sharp tip, for example, either an AFM tip or a nettle indenter, something like that. And they uh, monitor the elastic response as a function of deformation and use that to extract the uh, elastic moduli. However, this conventional method would not work for, two, uh, for isotropic material like black phosphorus. Why? Because if we indent it, we are deforming the crystal in all the directions. And the response, the mechanical response we are going to be measured will be coming from all the crystal directions. It has contribution from all these different crystalline axes. So it would be very difficult to decouple contribution from these different directions. Now, uh, people have been proposing ways that say uh, having a piece of black phosphorus only bending or stretching in one of the crystalline direction so that people can use some uh, equations from solid mechanics. However, that would require 2D material to bend like a piece of wood with deformation only taking place in one direction, but not the other. And we, uh, for those people working on 2D materials, we all know that's pretty uh, challenging to do, to do as well. So the key challenge here is how can we experimentally resolve the mechanical anisotropy in such a anisotropic 2D material? So we move on to a different instrument. And here, as you can see, we are thinking about a drum. If we have a piece of 2D material and we seal, for example, a circular cavity, uh, we effectively make a drum head resonator out of it. And it be should just behave like a drum. If we think about a drum, uh, that's a, a, a pretty interesting instrument because for the same drum, we can get different pitch out of it by hitting different parts on the drum. For example, if we hit the drum in the center, we might be able to excite uh, this resonance mode with the center part going up and down, uh, which has a lower pitch. If we hit somewhere else, uh, if we're really experienced and hit it correctly, we will be able to excite some other uh, vibrational mode like this one with one side going up and the other side going down and then alternatively vice versa, so on and so on. And that vibration will have a higher frequency, which means a higher pitch. And we've been thinking if we, are, we were able to uh, make a nanomechanical drum out of this 2D material, can we resolve the intrinsic isotropy by monitoring, uh, by exciting and monitoring all these different vibrational modes by listening to all these different pitches. Basically, can we hear the sound so that we can hear the material's intrinsic property? So uh, we went ahead and did some careful analysis um, uh, using numerical study. So this is what we found. 
what we found are uh, basically this summarizes what happens when we make a circular drum head out of uh, 2D materials. This uh, curve in the middle, uh, the black curve represent a circular drum head resonator made of uh, uh, unisotropic, unisotropic 2D material, while the other curves represent isotropic ones. The vertical axis is the resonance frequency and the horizontal axis is the number of mode. Um, and the color code in these things represents its mode shape. So red color stands for higher vibration amplitude and the blue color stands for minimal vibration amplitude. For example, if we see something with a red dot in the middle and a blue circle on the edge, it stands for this vibrational mode with the center part going up and down. And if we see two red areas, hot areas, it stands for this mode with uh, one side going up and the other side going down, or we would say it has two anti-nodes. So by comparing what we are seeing in isotropic material versus isotropic material, we realize by monitoring the higher resonant modes, we should be able to resolve this isotropy. So this is how it works. If we look at the lowest mode, basically everyone uh, has the same mode shape. The middle part goes up and down. Uh, it's just the frequency that's uh, different based on the different Young's moduli. Then we look at the higher modes. The second and third modes uh, typically have one side going up and the other side going down and they take turns. So basically it have two anti-nodes. And these two modes are typically 90 degree from each other uh, in terms of uh, geometry. However, the key difference is in an isotropic material, when you look at these two modes, they have exactly the same frequency, which is understandable because when you rotate a circular drum head made out of an isotropic material, 90 degrees from itself, it's still the same thing. Uh, so that uh, these two modes should have the same frequency, nothing has changed. Uh, and as we call it, these two modes are degenerate. Now, if we look at isotropic uh, drum head, if we turn this mode 90 degree from itself, we get the other mode. However, this time it's vibrating along a different axis and its frequency is much higher. This is understandable because the previous mode is vibrating along the soft axis and that gives less restoring force and lower, therefore lower frequency. If we turn it 90 degrees, it would be vibrating along the stiffer crystal axis and therefore larger, store, larger restoring force and that's higher frequency and so on and so forth. If we look at higher modes, um, it's even more obvious. For example, this donut shape, which is highly symmetric would never show up in an isotropic uh, drum head resonator. Uh, but instead it will show something with these three anti-nodes aligned. So with this uh, analysis, down and the results in mind, we went ahead and did the, did the experiment. So this is how our experiment looked like. We have a circular drum head resonator made out of black phosphorus crystal. And we went ahead um, and measured its resonance. Basically, we beat this drum and we listen to its tone. And we hear six different tones out of this drum. Uh, basically, these six peaks we see in the measured data represent the six different resonances at six different frequencies. Now, if we think about it, just knowing their frequency is not enough. We have to know how they vibrate, which means we need to be able to see what's the actual mode shape, in what shape they are vibrating. So we use this technique. Uh, technique we developed in our lab called spectral microscopy. Uh, basically, uh, 
this technique allows us to resolve spatially how a nano or micro resonator would vibrate uh, at each different frequency and reconstruct its mold shape. And we use this technique, this spectral microscopy technique in our black phosphorus uh, drum head resonators. And this is what we see here again. Red color stands for higher vibration amp uh, vibrational amplitude. And uh, uh, purple stands for minimal amplitude. And we are able to uh, create and, and visualize all these mode shapes for these six different resonant modes. So we compare our measured result with the uh, 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 numerical result, we Im immediately find that uh, the first fund mode or the fundamental mode as we expected is this symmetric mode with the center part going up and down. And the next two modes uh, as expected have two anti-nodes, basically two red areas. What's striking here is that these two modes have very different frequencies, which means they are highly degenerate. And that is the smoking gun proving that 2D material black phosphorus is highly mechanically isotropic because otherwise these two modes will have very similar frequencies. And immediately, immediately using these nanomechanical measurements, we were able to resolve the isotropic by pointing out this first mode must be vibrating along the soft axis, which is armchair direction, while the next mode must be vibrating along the stiffer axis, which is the zigzag direction. Just to confirm what we have uh, achieved here is indeed correct. We also performed optical measurements in different parts of this crystal. And uh, the result uh, shows excellent agreement with our nanomechanical measurement, basically used by, by watching how these nanoscale drums vibrate, we are able to resolve and tell what are the crystal directions. Further, uh, we, we can not only resolve the isotropy, but also quantitative, quantitatively extract the elastic moduli. And this is how we do that. So these are the six resonance mode we have measured out of this uh, uh, nanoscale drum resonator. And these are the measured frequencies. And then we adjust the parameters in our uh, numerical calculation to match the frequencies and mode shape to the experimental result. And this is what we get. By correctly choosing these elastic moduli, we are able to not just matching the mode shape, but also get the frequency matched up for all the six resonance modes. And this is indeed quite impressive because if we compare that with an isotropic mode, um, it would have a very hard time in matching even just the second mode because uh, you cannot see this mode splitting between second and third mode. And up there, uh, you got these two pizza-like mode, but you can only see one here and this, this donut mode, you can never find experimentally in an isotropic material. So basically by comparing them, it again, very strongly proves that the uh, black phosphorus crystal is indeed highly crystal. And these are the uh, elastic moduli in this 2D material. So, just to give a, a quick summary about this um, story, by making a nanoscale drum and by listening to its tone and watching its vibration spatially, both spatially and spe spectrally, we are able to resolve this highly isotropic behavior in 2D material and correctly extract its uh, mechanical properties. All right, so now let's move on to the third story. 
So when we are talking, uh, the third story is about dynamic range in 2D NEMS resonators. And again, we are still uh, talking about 2D materials here. But uh, if we think about what we have been just discussing, we are talking about drum head resonators. Um, usually we play drum in a band, but uh, if we actually think about it, we are carrying some uh, little drums with us on a daily basis. And uh, uh, I think many uh, in the audience might immediately realize what I'm talking about. And I think most of you probably get it correct. Uh, I'm talking about the eardrums uh, that most animals, most mammals um, have them. So an eardrum basically is a drum head resonator, or we can say a drum head transducer. Basically it transduces one form of signal, which is income sound to its own vibration and converts that to the neuron signal uh, so that we can hear the sound. And when we say certain, certain animals have better hearing than we do, uh, we are talking actually about a number of things. Uh, one thing could be it have a larger, it can respond to a larger frequency range. But on the other hand, we might be suggesting that the animals can hear in something, uh, some sound that's uh, so small that for humans, it was too light to hear. But for animals, they can hear those really, really quiet sounds. And uh, that is indeed a very important metric for a transducer, um, which we call dynamic range. So dynamic range refers to Dynamic range refers to things, um, uh, uh, refer to this specific property of a transducer. Uh, it refers to the maximum signal it can measure and the uh, minimum signal it can, the smallest signal it can measure and the range between them. And it's very important. So what determines the dynamic range of a transducer? Uh, for example, in a resonant transducer, one thing uh, that limits the dynamic range is nonlinearity. Ideally, a resonator would be a linear system uh, so that the response is always linear with the input. If we double the input, we double the output, double the amplitude. However, in reality, uh, it's typically nonlinear, which means as we continue to increase, the input, the output would not be able to follow the input forever. At some point, it's going to slow down and not able to uh, increase proportionally. So nonlinearity sets the upper limit of the so-called linear dynamic range. So what's limiting the lower end of linear dynamic range? And that's typically limited, fundamentally limited by the thermal noise. Uh, basically a transducer cannot measure anything, any input that's smaller than its intrinsic thermal noise. So both these things gives uh, uh, the, the fundamental dynamic, linear dynamic range of a transducer. And uh, um, for NAMPS resonators for these smaller structures, um, people have been trying to make them smaller and smaller. However, uh, back in, I think the 2000s, uh, researchers in Caltech have done a very careful study on the scaling of uh, uh, one-dimensional NEMS resonators. What they found was that as the resonator continued to scale down, its linear dynamic range is going to decrease um, as the device scales. And at some point, it's going to completely disappear so that the device is entirely linear. Therefore, as people scales down the device, on one hand, it probably becomes more sensitive because the device itself is smaller and it's, not, it's more um, responsive to external stimuli. But on the other hand, 
we are losing on the dynamic range. So there's always this trade-off. How can we uh, obtain something that's really small, so it's sensitive, but also having a large enough dynamic range? And that has become a quite important challenge uh, for nanoscale resonance sensors. So we went ahead and uh, did analysis uh, and found that for 2D NAMS resonators, if we make it into a drum head instead of a guitar string, we should be able to get rather large or broad dynamic range, even at nano scale. So we went ahead and uh, did the experiment. And uh, this is how we do it. We made these uh, drum head resonators out of this 2D semiconduct, semiconductor called uh, MOS2, molybdenum uh, disulfide. And we measure its uh, resonant motion from both completely undriven noise signal to the intensively driven nonlinear response. And this is what we see. When the input is really small, uh, the system just exhibit its own uh, noise behavior. And here we are able to measure the Brownian resonance uh, out of its noise spectrum. And that's basically the smallest signal we can measure on these devices. As we increase the drive, the response at the beginning increased linearly, but at some point it starts to go nonlinear. And from this thermomechanical motion all the way to the onset of nonlinearity, basically going from here all the way to where the output cannot follow the input signal, we found that indeed in these 2D drum head resonators, we can get a very large 70 dB of that linear dynamic range. And if we further consider uh, the elastic property of 2D material, they have a very high strain limit. We got another 40 dB-ish nonlinear dynamic range out of these devices, and that's pretty broad. Further, by applying uh, a voltage on these 2D drum head resonators, we are able to continuously tune its resonance frequency. So basically that's like we have a, a electrical drum and it has a knob on the side of it. And by turning that knob, we can adjust the tone of the, 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 the drum continuously. So let me show, uh, quickly show a video here um, that summarizes this part of story. So we are looking at uh, a monolayer MOS2 crystal and we make a little drum out of it. We can use a voltage to control how fast it vibrates, basically control the tone of this nanoscale drum. And if we look at the vibrational amplitude, at the beginning it's vibrating at the noise level, and then it goes up linearly with input power until the output cannot follow the input so that it becomes nonlinear. And in between, we have the dynamic range. So just to summarize this work, by making and exploring these two-dimensional drum head resonators, basically making these nanoscale drums, uh, we are able to realize really broad dynamic range in these, um, in these small drum head resonators. And the work has been featured in IEEE Spectrum uh, and the, the article has the title called Dynamic Range of Nano Resonators Extended to Animal Hearing. And uh, that's quite impressive because if we think about it, we were talking about uh, animals have very good hearing because uh, in some sense, they have very large dynamic range. Uh, they can hear very small sound and their eardrum does not blow up at very large sound. However, as we have pointed out uh, in 1D, resonators, as we scale them down, we are winning on the side, on the, on the, uh, on the front of sensitivity, but we are losing on the dynamic range. So there's always this trade-off. However, here, we are able to scale this thing all the way down to uh, 
uh, nanometer, uh, uh, an atomically thin membrane, which is orders of magnitude smaller than animals' eardrum, but we are able to still, we are able to maintain almost the same dynamic range, uh, which means we are not losing on the dynamic range end, but still gaining a lot on the sensitivity end. And that's why um, this work actually is quite important uh, in that particular sense. So, and this uh, concludes the, the third story of mine. And uh, with that said, I'm going to share uh, the fourth story, but that's going to be half story. Uh, I'm not going to dive too much into it because on one hand, it's because that thing is not a uh, complete instrument. Let's see uh, if the slides moves over. So here, the last piece of instrument if, uh, I'm going to talk about, if we can call it instrument, is tuning forks. Um, we can say tuning fork is a piece of musical instrument, but I don't think many people place, that, uh, place tuning fork. But instead, we use tuning fork to tune other musical instruments, for example, tuning the piano, uh, if it's been sitting there for a while, and we will come in with a tuning fork to make sure um, all the um, harmonics are correct. And the reason the tuning fork is so useful is we can basically make them long or short and uh, have them cover a very large range of frequencies or tones. And uh, if we think about it, uh, the vibration of tuning fork have two sides getting close from each other and away from each other periodically is indeed another vibration mode that could be seen in 2D materials. And that's this interlayer breathing mode, having a bilayer 2D system with the two layers vibrating just like the two halves of a tuning fork by moving towards and away from each other periodically. And this mode is indeed something quite analogous to what we have seen in 3D systems. For example, uh, in almost all the um, evaporators or sputter machines, we have something called a QCM, uh, a thickness monitor. Basically, it's a piece of quartz that can vibrate at a, uh, at a frequency and by uh, monitoring the frequency change, we can monitor how much metal or other material have deposited in our chamber. And uh, typically in a QCM, we have these two modes. One is the thickness mode, one is the sharing mode. And all these modes people have been using in QCM indeed are exist, existent in 2D layered system. For example, in this bilayer system, we have this interlayer sharing mode that is analogous to the sharing mode in the QCM. And we have the interlayer breathing mode, which we just talked about is like our tuning fork. So how do we measure those modes? Um, these modes are at actually quite high frequency. So um, how do we measure this kind of vibration? Uh, because they are usually at much, much higher frequency than all the other uh, nanoscale musical instruments I have shown you so far. And people have been using this technique called uh, uh, ultra frequency Raman to monitor these resonance um, on the uh, uh, very, very high, uh, almost terahertz frequency band. And they are able to resolve these different vibrations using that technique. Further, uh, in addition to just vibrating them, um, people sometimes would also want to study the physical properties of the 2D system as the two layer gets closer away from each other, because that's something, this interlayer spacing is related to a very important physical quantity called um, interlayer coupling. And how do we do that? When it's vibrating, it's changing too fast. Sometimes we want to just have a static deformation of this tuning fork. And for tuning fork, as we know, it's pretty stiff in order to change 
the spacing between these two halves of the tuning fork, we have to press it down with a large force, just like we uh, when we work on these uh, um, uh, uh, grip strengtheners. And that's also what typically we use in 2D material is we use something called a, a diamond avial cell. And that can create really high pressure and push the two layers towards each other, just like we are using the uh, grip uh, strengthener. And that allows us to study a lot of uh, uh, physical uh, processes as we bring these layers closer. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up here uh, because otherwise uh, that would be uh, too much physics in this part. Um, and uh, uh, for people who are interested, uh, uh, I, I, would direct, uh, I would direct you to this recent paper we have published, but I just want to summarize on this half story. Um, for bilayer 2D systems, their interlayer vibration are just like tuning forks. And by using high pressure technique, we can push the layers toward each other, just like we are exercising a grip strengthener so that we can study the rich physics by tuning the interlayer coupling in these systems. So uh, with that, I would like to thank all the funding agencies who have supported this work. And finally, going back to this initial slide uh, where I started on, I hope by sharing these stories uh, with you guys, I have convinced you that actually physicist, physicists are musicians. We don't have to decide between one or, one or the other because a lot of physical processes are just like what's going on in daily musical instruments. Thank you. Thank you so much for the Beautiful talk. Thanks, Paul. Let me pull up our slides, and there are a number of questions for you. All right. Uh, let me do that. Uh, let's see. The first one is uh, Professor Wang, thank you uh, for the uh, carbon nanotube nano guitar string. Both the fabrication and measurement are difficult, uh, but can reach high resolution for mass detection. Did you calculate the possible limits of detection there? All right, uh, thanks for the question. Yes, it's indeed very difficult to make and very difficult to measure. Uh, took me probably two or three years to make my first work example and uh, get my first signal. Um, so the resolution is pretty high as I have uh, shown in some of the previous slides I'm not going to uh, basically go all the way back to the earlier slides. Uh, basically in those Caltech and Berkeley and the European work uh, at that time, back in 2008, people have shown that using these nanoscale guitar string, we can resolve um, mass change down to a single atom. There are people, their uh, work showing single uh, gold atom, single argon atom, and uh, the European group have been continuing pushing on this front. And uh, years later, they have shown that it can resolve all the way down to a single proton mass. Uh, so that was actually the most sensitive mass detector humankind have ever made. Uh, they, they have shown on their nanotube resonator, uh, the, the nanoscale guitar string, it's responsive to the mass change on the scale of an individual proton. Uh, and I, I think that was really, really impressive. Fascinating. Uh, next question is, I studied your, you had some very engaged <laughs> listeners here. I studied your NC paper. It's inspiring work, especially the simulation results matching the exper experimental results so well. Can you tell us how you do the simulations and how long they take? Uh, all right. Uh, uh, excuse me, just want to make sure, are we talking about the black phosphorus work, the, the nano letter paper? I, I think so. It wasn't, uh, the question came in 
without uh, uh, further explanation. Oh, I think oh, that would okay, be a good, one. Pretty, let me see. Be a good uh, one to discuss. Um, yes. Nature Come paper. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I think, I think uh, I'm just, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, let me just one. try, yes. <laughs> let me just try to show the, uh, I think, because I didn't actually talk about my nature communications paper, I was more talking about my um, nano letters paper where okay. I was bragging how well the uh, how well the the simulation matches the uh, experiment. Um, basically, what I was doing um, back then it was actually done by most of the simulation work was done by my. Um, uh, uh, equal contribution first author, Dr. Hao Jia, who is a faculty at CIMIT right now. Basically what we are doing is we run the simulation by uh, parametrically varying the input parameter, which is the Young's moduli in this anisotropic 2D material. And we look at watched output by seeing what are the frequencies of all these different resonant mode. And we came up with a parameter that describes the error between simulation and the, 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 the experimental result. And we explore the, uh, the parameter space to minimize that. So basically the error, if we think about it, uh, the error uh, where I plot it as a function of these two input parameters is going to look like a funnel. And there is a minimum point showing that I have obtained uh, best agreement between my simulation and experiment. And uh, at that minimum point, we were able to achieve less than 2% error. Actually, most of them are less than 1% in all the resonant mode in terms of the discrepancies in resonance frequency between our calculation and our uh, experiment. And basically that's how we are so confident that the Young's moduli we measure this way is going to be a very decent result. Uh, I very hope, uh, I actually took quite a while because running those simulations uh, are not that easy. Yes. <laughs> and we have time for just one more question. Uh, okay. Uh, to design super sensitive NEMS resonators, size effects originate not just from the structure, but also from the materials properties. And uh, can you comment on this aspect of the of uh, you know what the effects are here. All right. So yeah, thanks. Uh, excellent question. So uh, let me just use that to grab about my <laughs> uh, brag about uh, my choice of materials here. So for example, when I was sharing uh, this story about the drum head resonator, I said I said I made a nano mechanical drum uh, and I beat it and I listened to the sounds. I watch how it vibrates and resolved isotropy. I was talking about uh, black phosphorus. However, as I move on to the next story, I have changed the material to MOS2, uh, which is a totally different 2D material. And I didn't explain why I did that. I didn't explain uh, the logic behind, behind my choice. And indeed, the concern is very related to this question. So if we think about it, I, I, I was claim, I was saying, uh, I was trying to measure dynamic range and measuring dynamic range requires me to not being able to, not only being able to measure the intensively driven nonlinear motion, I must be able to measure the very small, the, the miniscale um, thermal mechanical motion. Basically, it's like not driving the device at all. You, you're not beating the drum, you're not touching it, but it's just vibrating on its own because of uh, the intrinsic thermal motion. And that requires extremely sensitive detect scheme. And we are talking about just one, two, three, or four layer of of MOS2 here. Why do I choose MOS2 for this extremely sensitive measurement? Because MOS2 among all the 2D materials we had at that time, it has the largest index of refraction, which means using optical signal, using optical transduction scheme 
it's going to be most sensitive to the device motion in MOS2 because its index of refraction is the largest, it's further away, it's furthest away from one. And that means it will reflect most amount of light. Therefore, I'm going to get the best signal transduction, which allows me to measure this extremely small um, thermal mechanical motion. So yes, material choice is extremely important. And that sometimes means um, uh, the success of the measurement. Thanks. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, I'm afraid Tom. we don't have time for more questions, but if we were together now, we would uh, walk right. off the stage and hand Thank you, you uh, a certificate. And I hope uh, sometime very soon uh, we'll get to see each other in the in the real world uh, to do so. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you so much for the beautiful talk okay, and, okay. Thank you. and elaboration during the uh, questions. And All right. Now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, turn the stage over to Professor Alan Shang to introduce our final speaker.